Hello, I'm Tracy Wallach. In this video, we're going to take a system psychodynamic approach to guns and gun violence in America. Taking a system psychodynamic approach means looking at the role or meaning an individual, group, or thing, in this case guns, has or is given on behalf of the larger system, in this case society. This video is dedicated to the memory of Earl T. Braxton, who is a mentor, friend, and colleague. I'd like to introduce you to Justin Brogdon, who wrote and will narrate this video. Justin is an attorney in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He received his Juris Doctorate from Boston College Law School in 2013. He has a private practice representing children and families involved in the foster care system. From 2017 to 2022, he worked at MIT as a Title IX investigator. Beginning in 2023, he continued his work as an external Title IX investigator in higher education. Justin has a long-standing interest in history and politics and has been doing group relations conference work as a member and consultant since 2012. Today, I want to talk about guns. In the United States, we are greeted on a daily basis with news about gun violence and on an almost weekly basis with news of another mass shooting. And the trend is only getting worse. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there were over 12,000 deaths due to gun violence in 2014. In 2020, that number climbed to over 19,000 deaths. For every 100 people in this country, there are an estimated 120 guns. In the United States, it is now easier for an 18-year-old to buy a gun than a six-pack of beer. Despite this, our political system has seemed either unable or unwilling to respond to the growing problem. So how did we get here? And how can group relations theory help us make sense of our nation's addiction to guns? Gun ownership is deeply intertwined with white male American identity. Gun ownership allowed colonists to gain their independence from Britain, and for most of American history, assert near total domination over the political and economic system. Guns remain an important tool for white men to frame their relationship to the federal government. However, as their economic and political power erodes, this is manifested in increasingly irrational ways. Let's start at the beginning. So the Declaration of Independence was about rising up against tyranny, right? If you were educated in the United States, this may sound somewhat familiar to you. The 13 colonies rebelled after unfair taxes were levied against them by the tyrannical British king, and after winning independence, still wary of investing absolute power into a central government, they crafted a constitution meant to balance federal authority with states' rights. And while that makes for a great national origin myth, what is often missing from our history books is the role that race played in our nation's founding. Take the Declaration of Independence, for example. It lays out 27 grievances against the King of England, the last of which states, He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. The wealthy landowners in the colonies were upset because they wanted to expand west of the Appalachian Mountains, but the king had promised to respect the sovereignty of the indigenous population. And the part about domestic insurrection? The founders were referring to slave rebellions. So from the beginning, the founding fathers were not just worried about tyranny. They were concerned about controlling the indigenous and slave population. These concerns influenced the Constitution, including the Second Amendment. The Revolutionary War started as a BYOG, or bring your own gun affair. There are few arms manufacturers in the colonies, and the Continental Army relied on soldiers to bring their own weapons from home. In fact, even prior to the war, many of the colonies made it mandatory for free, able-bodied white men to serve in the militia and required them to own their own gun. These laws continued well after the nation's founding. In this sense, owning a gun was a necessary part of a white man's obligation 
to protect his state and his country. Often central to the gun control debate is the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. To take a group relations approach, it helps to view the United States of America as a group, with the states and the federal government being members of that group. You can think of the United States Constitution as outlining the roles, tasks, authority, and boundaries for the federal government. However, the Constitution was not the first attempt to do so. From a group relations perspective, when task, role, boundaries, and authority are not agreed upon or in alignment, it leaves a space for irrational processes to arise. Prior to the Constitution, the states were governed by the Articles of Confederation, which was passed by the Continental Congress in 1777 and established a League of Friendship between the states. The states retained many of their rights and the central government was designed to be very weak. There was no real executive branch or judiciary. Additionally, while the article said that Congress had the sole authority to make peace and war, it did not have the authority to raise an army. In early American history, guns were used by white male citizens to demand greater economic equality. In 1786 and 1787, Daniel Shays helped lead a protest in western Massachusetts by farmers angry over high taxes and tax laws that favored wealthy farmers. The armed protesters occupied several courthouses in Massachusetts and attempted to storm the federal armory. Without a national army, Massachusetts had to rely on a state militia funded by private citizens. The federal government's inability to stop the protest, which became known as Shays' Rebellion, terrified many of the founders. Of Shays' Rebellion, Henry Knox wrote to George Washington, They see the weakness of government. They feel at once their own poverty compared with the opulent, and their own force, and they are determined to make use of the latter in order to remedy the former. Our government must be braced, changed, or altered to secure our lives and property. Shays' Rebellion was one of the first insurrections after the Revolutionary War and led many founding fathers, including George Washington, to see the need for a new and stronger central government with the ability to raise an army. In essence, a stronger government was necessary not just to protect from foreign powers, but from threats within, specifically an armed citizenry, especially those who were poor and angry over income inequality. The new constitution was ratified in 1789, just a couple years after Shays' Rebellion. The constitution established a stronger central government with more authority over the common defense. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gave the federal government something that it lacked under the Articles of Confederation, the power to raise an army. This power was quickly put to the test when another rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, broke out in Pennsylvania, again in response to farmers being angered over taxes. President George Washington was able to assemble an army and march on the protesters. The mere threat was enough to put down the rebellion and establish the authority of the federal government. While the states saw this new, stronger central government as necessary, they remained worried about the potential for this power to be abused. Even before the Constitution was ratified in 1789, it was clear to many that it would need to be amended. The Bill of Rights, ratified in 1791, was a series of ten amendments to the Constitution. It's worth noting that the amendments are not numbered in order of their importance, but in order of the sections of the Constitution they are amending. The Second Amendment simply states, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Second Amendment was a direct response to the federal government's new ability to raise an army as granted in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. So in a sense, while the U.S. Constitution gave the federal government a new role and task, the Second Amendment reaffirmed that the individual states continued to have a role in their own security and the authority to raise armies of their own. Southern states were concerned that the federal government, which was dominated by the northern states, could not be trusted to use its newly established powers to help crush slave rebellions. As such, the Second Amendment was not only about easing the concerns of those worried about the potential for tyranny, but about assuring southern states and slave owners that they would continue to have state militias available as a slave control device. <laughs>
While much of the debate surrounding the Second Amendment has centered around whether it bestows a collective or individual right to bear arms, it's likely both. However, the individual's right to bear arms was inextricably linked to the state's right to have a well-regulated militia. For most of American history, the Supreme Court seemed comfortable limiting the reach of the Second Amendment. In U.S. v. Cruikshank, white men were convicted under the Ku Klux Klan Act after as many as 150 black citizens were killed by a white mob following a hotly contested Louisiana governor's election in what became known as the Colfax Massacre. Several white men, including Cruikshank, were convicted of, among other things, violating the black citizens' lawful right to bear arms. In overturning their convictions, the Supreme Court held that the right to bear arms is not a right guaranteed by the Constitution. Neither is it in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence. The Second Amendment declares that it shall not be infringed, but this means no more than it shall not be infringed by Congress. The Supreme Court was essentially saying that the Constitution did not provide an inherent right to bear arms. It merely prevented Congress from infringing on that right in states where it existed. While the ruling limited the scope of the Second Amendment, as historian Leonard Levy explained, Cruikshank paralyzed the federal government's attempt to protect black citizens and, in effect, shaped the Constitution to the advantage of the Ku Klux Klan. In Presser v. Illinois, the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of Herman Presser under an Illinois law forbidding citizens from forming private military organizations without permission from the state government. Presser was arrested after he had paraded a group of 400 armed German-American workers affiliated with the Socialist Labor Party through the streets of Chicago. Presser claimed that his Second Amendment right to bear arms was violated. However, the Supreme Court held that restrictions on the rights of an individual to bear arms was permissible so long as it did not infringe upon the ability to provide public security. In United States v. Miller, the Supreme Court upheld the National Firearms Act, which placed restrictions on certain types of firearms. The law was passed in response to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Jack Miller was a bank robber and a member of an Irish gang. In this decision upholding Miller's conviction, the Supreme Court noted that when the Constitution was written, the sentiment of the time strongly disfavored standing armies. The common view was that adequate defense of country and laws could be secured through the militia. Civilians primarily, soldiers on occasion, the militia comprised all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. And further, when called for service, these men were expected to appear bearing arms supplied by themselves and of the kind in common use at the time. The court went on to say that in the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of the firearms restricted by the National Firearms Act had some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. Miller provided perhaps the clearest link between the state's right to a well-regulated militia and the protections of the Second Amendment, and that's essentially where things stood for close to 70 years. Today, every state has a militia force, or National Guard. Participation is not mandatory, and weaponry is provided. Extending the logic in Miller into modern times, one might conclude that a wide range of gun control legislation would thus be permissible. In fact, there has been such legislation throughout U.S. history, especially in disarming people of color. While white citizens had a Second Amendment right, and even a duty to own guns, slaves and free blacks were often prohibited from carrying firearms. In a Dred Scott case, Chief Justice Roger Taney argued that one reason black people could not be citizens under the Constitution was that it would give them the right to keep and carry arms wherever they went. This reasoning contradicted previous Supreme Court decisions, in addition to being fear-mongering and blatantly racist. For this reason, Dred Scott is widely considered one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in American history. After the Civil War, the passage of black codes in the southern states made it a criminal offense for a black person to own a gun. Fear of black people with guns continued into the 20th century. In 1967, California passed gun control legislation that targeted the Black Panther movement. The following year, Congress passed the Gun Control Act. A supporter of the law said his purpose was not to control guns, but to control blacks. In 
Ironically, the National Rifle Association supported these laws. The NRA wasn't always the extreme anti-gun control organization it's become today. Founded in 1871, the NRA supported gun control legislation until the 1970s, believing it necessary to prevent violent crime and protect gun ownership for hunters and sportsmen. However, following the Civil Rights Movement in which states lost much of their ability to use their police power to segregate and control the black population, the gun control debate increasingly focused on the individual's right to bear arms. It was only in 1977, after the NRA's moderate leadership was overthrown by hardline gun rights activists, that the group made the idea that every individual had a constitutional right to unrestricted gun ownership central to his activism. At the time, this idea was considered radical. The conservative movement of the 80s, personified by Ronald Reagan, increasingly embraced this radical interpretation of the Second Amendment and helped make it mainstream in the movement by the 1990s. Reagan himself supported the 1993 Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, which required background checks and a waiting period for gun sales. But during his presidency, he appointed judges who shared this new sacrosanct view of the Second Amendment, including Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. By the 1990s, the country was seeing a growing militia movement that was comprised of armed paramilitary groups with roots in white power organizing. In 1992, a botched federal raid on white separatists Randy and Vicki Weaver at Ruby Ridge resulted in three deaths, including the Weaver's 14-year-old son and a U.S. Marshal. The following year, a federal siege against a militant religious sect in Waco, Texas, resulted in the deaths of 86 people. These incidents, which played out live on television, led to feelings of victimization by the federal government among these militia groups and further galvanized the militia movement. While largely non-existent in the late 1980s, by the mid-90s there were over 858 known militias in the U.S. The boundaries between the conservative movement and far-right militia groups became blurred during this time. They were united by anger toward the federal government, opposition to gun control, suspicion of federal bureaucracies, and hostility toward the success of black, feminist, and gay rights movements. Also during this time, the NRA became an organization that increasingly promoted a mythologized frontier masculinity, which emphasizes men's heroic defense of the white, heterosexual, conservative social order. Shortly after the incidents at Ruby Ridge in Waco, Texas, the 1993 Brady Bill was passed. This was followed in 1994 by the Assault Weapons Ban, which prohibited some semiotic weapons and large-capacity magazines, and further polarized the gun control debate into an absolutist cause. The new conservative movement saw in all these actions the tyranny the Founding Fathers had feared. At the time, NRA President Wayne LaPierre said the ban gave jack-booted government thugs more power to take away our constitutional rights, break in our doors, seize our guns, destroy our property, and even injure or kill us. The assault weapons ban was passed as part of the 1994 crime bill. The crime bill was deeply rooted in racialized fears of inner city gang violence and is blamed for the subsequent mass incarceration of black men. The bipartisan bill passed in the Senate 95 to 4. The bill passed 235 to 194 in the House of Representatives. In order to garner the support of moderates, the assault weapons ban was given a sunset provision, meaning that it would expire in 10 years if not renewed. However, by 2004, the political winds had shifted. Shortly after the assault weapons ban passed, the Democrats suffered a significant electoral defeat in the midterm elections and lost control of the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. Democrats believe the assault weapons ban contributed to their electoral losses. Republicans were nearly unified in their opposition, thanks in part to lobbying efforts from pro-gun groups. Additionally, the crime rate had decreased steadily throughout the 90s. The dominant narrative, fueled by the new more radical NRA and the Ruby Ridge and Waco incidents, became less about the fear of black violence and more about the perceived infringement on a fundamental liberty, the Second Amendment right to bear arms. By 2008, this new radical view of the Second Amendment had filtered up to the Supreme Court, which made an abrupt U-turn from its long-held precedent of upholding gun control legislation. At the time, 
the District of Columbia had some of the toughest gun control laws in the country. In the district, all guns had to be registered. Handguns were banned unless the gun owner received a one-year permit from the police chief. Lawfully registered firearms such as rifles had to be kept unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock unless the firearms were in a place of business or being used for legal recreational activities. Dick Anthony Heller was a police officer in the District of Columbia. Though he was authorized to carry a handgun while on duty, his application for a handgun permit was denied. Heller filed suit and argued that the D.C. law violated his Second Amendment rights. The Supreme Court had established precedent that the Second Amendment did not create a right to bear arms. It merely prohibited the federal government from infringing on the right as granted by the states. States were free to place limits on guns as long as they did not interfere with the ability to form a militia and the firearms in question were not used by the military. Based on this established precedent, the district court dismissed Heller's complaint. However, the Supreme Court reversed the district court's ruling and held that the D.C. law did, in fact, violate Heller's Second Amendment rights. In many of the cases preceding Heller, the court was comfortable with a narrow view of the Second Amendment when the impacted parties were on the fringes of society or part of marginalized or oppressed groups. However, when the District of Columbia, a majority black community, attempted to restrict the rights of a white man living in the district, the Supreme Court stepped away from precedent and ruled the Second Amendment protects the individual's right to possess and carry weapons in cases of confrontation. In other words, the Second Amendment now provided a right to self-defense. Writing for the majority, Justice Antonin Scalia justified his perspective by noting that abolitionists sometimes argued that black Americans had a right to bear arms for self-defense. However, as seen in cases like U.S. v. Cruikshank, following the Colfax Massacre, many of these self-defense arguments failed and free slaves were routinely disarmed by southern states after the Civil War. It is ironic that these arguments made by abolitionists and free slaves looking for protection from violence were mostly rejected by courts in their time. These same arguments were now being used to justify striking down gun control laws in the mostly black district so that a white police officer could have a gun in his home for self-defense. The implicit message the court was sending was that Heller needed protection from the large number of people of color living around him. While the reasons for gun ownership are undeniably complex, the history of gun ownership and gun control in the United States are inextricably linked to race. 84% of gun owners in the United States are white. Research shows that support for gun rights is strongest among whites who are racially prejudiced. They are more likely to be vigilant to perceive threats and to direct their attention to racial minorities. Self-defense is now the number one reason for gun ownership in the United States. Since the Heller decision, the number of mass shootings has steadily increased. In 2014, there were 269 mass shootings. In 2022, there were over 628 mass shootings, with over 3,100 people shot, resulting in over 637 deaths. Nearly all mass shooters are male, and the majority are white. 20% of mass shooters are motivated by hate. Mass shootings have been linked to economic stress and feelings of powerlessness in response to eroding labor opportunities. The changing economy since the 1960s has challenged male identity as breadwinners and heads of household. In 1960, 70% of men were the primary breadwinners for their household, compared to 31% today. Men may respond to their eroding labor opportunities by embracing gun ownership as an expression of their masculinity and as a compensatory effort to reestablish their role in a sense of agency. Nearly a third of mass shootings occur at the shooter's current or former job, making the workplace the most common location for these incidents. Even mass shootings driven by hate can often be linked to economic stress and feelings of powerlessness. In these situations, the mass shooter projects their insecurity outward and blames the other for their situation. This plays out on a systemic level where we see a correlation between mass shootings and the health of the economy. For years now, the gun lobby has controlled the narrative around gun violence. The aftermath of mass shootings follows a predictable pattern. Expressions of thoughts and prayers for the victims and their families, outrage and call for gun reform and improved mental health services, followed by silence and lack of action.
Many in the gun rights community have argued that guns don't shoot people, people shoot people, and that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, as famously proposed by NRA head Wayne LaPierre. This is proven false in a number of studies and by gun statistics. Gun violence is not a result of individual bad apples or mental illness, but rather is a systemic problem that can only be addressed on a systemic and cultural level. For example, through structures such as laws, policies, and procedures. Australia has demonstrated what might happen if gun violence is addressed systemically rather than as an individual mental health problem. In 1996, following a mass shooting in which 35 people were killed by a man using a semi-automatic rifle, the Australian government passed sweeping gun control legislation, which included a ban on automatic and semi-automatic weapons. The law included a mandatory program in which the government bought and destroyed guns owned by their citizens. In the 18 years prior to the gun reform, Australia had 13 mass shootings. In the more than 25 years since, they've only had one. Despite the increasing number of mass shootings in the United States, the federal government has struggled to respond. Congress has failed to pass any meaningful gun legislation to ban or restrict specific types of firearms. The Bipartisan Safer Communities Act of 2022, passed one month after a mass shooting at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, had more to do with mental health, school safety, and funding for related programs than with banning or restricting specific types of firearms. In 2021, gun rights groups spent $15.8 million on lobbying, five times more than gun control groups. Gun rights groups have actually increased their lobbying efforts in response to mass shootings. 44% of Americans report knowing someone who has been shot. Recent increases in gun violence and mass shootings show the need for greater regulation and evidence from other countries demonstrates that gun regulations significantly decrease death and injury from gun violence. Despite this, the percentage of Americans favoring stricter gun laws has actually declined since 2017. The conversation around gun control is increasingly polarized and irrational. For many, guns represent power and protection. If we are to have effective public safety, we should start not just by understanding our history, but by examining how our views on guns and gun control continue to be influenced by race, gender, and socioeconomic status. Like many of us who grew up in the United States, I carry inside me the story of a country founded upon a fight against tyranny and a commitment to freedom, justice, and democracy. Unfortunately, our actual history has not always lived up to these ideals. Our early education often leaves out the unsavory aspects of our history, the genocide and land theft from indigenous people, and how our economy was built upon chattel slavery. If we the people are tasked with forming a more perfect union, then we must confront the organizational and social dynamics contributing to our gun culture. By acknowledging the uncomfortable and complex history of the Second Amendment, gun ownership and gun control, we can finally move beyond our defenses in the current irrational dialogue and toward a new understanding of ourselves and our country. For more information about the history of guns and gun violence in the U.S., please see the following references. For more information about my coaching and consulting practice, please visit www.tracywallach.com.